For at TV, the world is thinking. At the railway crossing near my house, there is a boom gate, a separate pedestrian crossing that automatically locks when trains approach, flashing lights, a clanging alarm, and for a while in 2007, a gigantic billboard emblazoned with Don't Risk It, part of a half million dollar government campaign to raise awareness of the dangers of level crossings. As each train draws within about 400 metres of the crossing, it issues a loud blast from its horn in order to alert those people who have failed to heed the boom gate, the automatically locking pedestrian gate, the lights, the alarm, and in 2007, the billboard. In days gone by, each of these things on its own would have been considered ample warning that stepping onto train tracks can be dangerous. In the small country town where I grew up, I made my way across train tracks far from any official crossing every day after school. And I don't recall ever needing any more warning than the tracks themselves. The profusion of safety measures at my local crossing suggests a near pathological relationship with risk. The belief that 300 tonne trains moving at 80 kilometres per hour through urban environments can be made completely safe if only we add a few more bells and lights. Today, the Australian child mortality rate is six per thousand children. Each one represents an unimaginable tragedy, but the rate is 3.6% lower than it was five years before, 5.8% lower than it was five years before that, and 11.9% lower than it was five years earlier again. Against this, we have never been more obsessed with keeping our children safe. A 2006 study found that after many schools have banned running, the playing of informal games, or unsupervised access to sporting equipment, the most common lunch break activity for Australian Year 7 students is sitting and talking. <laughs> if our numbers have followed the British trend, then less than one in 10 Australian children make their own way to school today, compared to eight in 10 two decades ago. And if we are beginning to reverse this trend, it's not because we are conquering our fear of risk. On the contrary, it's because of the emergence of a new danger from which our children require protection, the obesity epidemic. It seems that as our world grows safer, the risks that remain become more stark. Take a 2003 survey which found that Australians overwhelmingly believed that crime rates were rising. Older Australians in particular believed they were rising dramatically. But Australian crime rates in almost every category have been dropping steadily, and in the five years prior to the study, crime victimisation rates fell around 20%. This increasing intolerance for risk has already led us down some dark paths. In 2002, US President George W. Bush argued for the invasion of Iraq, despite the absence of any compelling evidence that that nation had weapons of mass destruction, because there was a risk that it might. We cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun, that could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Not even the war's most aggressive proponents claim Saddam Hussein actually possessed the means to drop a nuclear bomb on an American city. But there were claims, false as it turned out, but still credible at the time, that Iraq had attempted to acquire yellow cake uranium from Niger. Yellow cake uranium could, if Iraq had a lot of money, scientists, time and expensive equipment, be separated, purified, and used as a warhead in a long-range missile, if Iraq had any long-range missiles. Therefore, no one could deny that there was a risk. A tiny, extraordinarily convoluted risk, perhaps, but a risk nevertheless. The danger of Iraq's non-existent nuclear arsenal felt compelling because it had several risk properties that humans tend to exaggerate. Its likelihood was unknown, it would affect a great number of people. It was beyond the ability of you as an individual to control. And it was completely outside normal experience, yet, thanks to Hollywood and videotape, easy to imagine. Take by way of comparison the risk of stepping into a car. This is a lot safer today than it once, once was, but is still more likely to kill you than anything else except heart disease, cancer, and stroke. That, however, is a known risk you are not going to be surprised to discover that in fact 50% of all car trips end in death, that cars were in fact far more dangerous than you knew. Furthermore, while a crash may have dreadful consequences, its scope is relatively small. It will not affect dozens or thousands of people, so it doesn't have the same capacity to grip the mind as, say, a plane crash. Also, you have ridden in cars for as long as you can remember, so it's part of your normal life. And, most importantly, at the wheel of a car, you are, or feel you are, in control. Control is key. 
If you have a mother, as I do, who grips the sides of her seat when you navigate a T intersection, who closes her eyes around corners and gasps during merging, merging, try not to take it as a comment on your ability. It may be, rather, that risks seem larger when you can't do anything about them. 